Hi. Hi. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, there we go. Hi. So I'm running a little today. I rolled out of bed and then we went grocery shopping to try to get like the early hours, the senior hours. And um, it, like it ends up being a two hour procedure going grocery shopping. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anyhow, so I'm just getting I'm pulling myself together here still. Mm. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, no complaints. Things are settling in, I feel like. <laughs> I know, it does sort of feel like uh, you, people, you, you start to get used to, um, you know, it starts to become the new normal. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So today, also, I'm going to, I realized that I was not taking full advantage of the screen sharing. Let's see. Uh, so I have to pull something up. And then we'll get started. Okay. Hi. Hello. All right. So um, let's get started. Oh, look, and there's a whiteboard option too. I hadn't seen that. All right. Well. <sighs> So let's uh, do an ohm and then I'll lead call and response to the invo. Oh, so I could bring up the invocation actually too. Let's see. Fine. Let's see, do I have that? Let's. Um, Um, do you all have the invocation? If you have it, I won't look for it. But if you don't, I will. Well, I'm just going to do it once, call and response. So my screen sharing is paused. All right. Okay. Okay. Everybody ready? We'll start with an ohm and then here's the, um, here's the invocation. Can you all see it? Okay. Uh, Ganeshaya Namaha. Together. Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha. Om Shri Saraswatiya Namaha. Om Shri Saraswatiya Namaha. Om Namo. Gurave Namaha Om Namo Gurave Namaha
Okay. Um, so as per our decision last week, can you all see this? The new chair? All right. So today we're going to uh, go through, we're going to start chanting the Yoga Sutras. We're going to start with book one. Book one is Samadhi Pada. And it is um, Pada. And it, Pada. Right. And it is uh, um, on Samadhi, which is um, absorption in uh, conscious. Uh, cosmic consciousness with awareness of being absorbed in complete absorption in cosmic consciousness. So, um, as you can, so I, it's not that hard to, it's not that easy to see. So I have the images from my book here for us. We can follow along, but also um, in the uh, here, I have tried to. You can barely see it because. In this area, right, that there's the there's the transliteration. Um, it's all this is in a semi bold print, most of it. But I have tried, I've bolded where the um, the 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 longs. In terms of chanting it yourself, the most important thing is to understand is to get the longs long and the short short. So we'll go over that sum and we'll go over the word by word. And also with this particular, um, I made this up for today. This has the, um, the word by word breakdown, which we'll also go over. Atta yoga nushasanam. Together? Atta yoga nushasanam. Atta, Atta, Yoga, Yoga, Anushasanam, Anushasanam, Om. We'll pause them after the first three, and even and now go as they go over the word by word. When we pause, one of the things Shanta sometimes says, uh, my teacher, uh, for a second, see if you can forget your name and form, and only connect to the vibration of the Sanskrit. So just for a second, if you can forget who you are, and only feel that vibration, then you'll have done all you need to do for the day. <laughs> So atta, <laughs> atta means now. I, I heard of a, um, of, a, of a Swami in India who uh, was teaching a program that somebody showed me. I listened to it, but it's in Hindi, so I didn't really understand. <laughs> but apparently he did one whole, he told like eight different meanings for atta, but it basically means now. The point of the first sutra of any, uh, of any, book of sutra, any collection of sutras, or the, is to introduce the subject. So anyone, so I have a picture of a glass of spilled milk there, which takes some liberty with it, with the idea that now, you know, now that the milk is spilled, now that the mess is made, now that things are like a wreck, or annoying, or whatever, now is the time for the teaching of yoga. But that's taking some liberty with it. And anybody who tells you that Patanjali meant anything more than to just say, now I'm going to tell you about yoga. Um, they're wrong because that, that, that traditionally that's all that it means. Atta is considered um, favorable. It's, it's considered, there's, I think there's two words that are considered favorable to begin the, um, any collection of sutras or any teachings. So Atta being one of them. Uh, now, here with, at this auspicious moment, this point of transition, now. Uh, yoga is the subject of the work. Anushasanam, it, it means instruction or the exposition in the teaching of yoga. 
The prefix anu means following. It shows up in various different words in the sutra, so it'll be, so, you know, sort of noticing it. It means, um, and it's, it's part of various different compound words also. And shasanam is like shastra, it's the teaching, the instruction, whatever. So these, so by adding that prefix anu, he tells you that he is following the teachings. He didn't make them up. So together again, Atta yoga nushasanam. Together, Atta yoga nushasanam. In so, in terms of understanding when it's long and short, obviously, if it's if it shows a long if it shows the line over it, uh, like like yoga nushasanam shasanam, that is long. Um, it is also long if like this is yoga. That's because there are two consonants that follow the a, ah, even though that's a short a, ah, it gets lengthened. The r does too, and the, oh, you have to remember though that the d and h is a daha, one letter, not two. I'm going forward. Okay, so I'll leave this one. Yoga shchitta vritti nirodaha. Together. Yoga, I'll leave the word by word. Yoga. Yoga, chitta, chitta, vritti, vritti, nirodaha, nirodaha. So this is the biggie. This is the one. So first he starts off by saying, now this is the, the, I'm going to teach you about yoga. So the first obvious question is, what is yoga? This is the answer to the question, the definition of yoga that is going to be pursued throughout the, the book. Um, yoga is the, um, the nirodaha, which is um, from, uh, it's from nirud, which is like to, it's like a sort of a, a, a noose, to resist. Rud is to suppress or, or, uh, or um, restrict. And ni is the preface, pre, the prefix. So it means anything from the uh, harnessing, the controlling, the restriction, the um, uh, what are the, it can also mean the suppression, even though that's not a word, the control, basically, the restraint or the control, the inhibition of the vritti, which is the activity of the chitta. So this, the, the, um, this is a very difficult, it, it's actually very difficult. Most of the time people say yoga is the stilling of the movements of the mind, but the chitta is much more than the mind. In the, in the um, Samkhya, or all of the in Indian philosophy, the mind, as the chitta would be composed of three elements, manas would be the actual mind. And the mind is what like takes in any impulse. So manas would be like the part of you that, that absorbs, you know, any sort of uh, that 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 makes sense of seeing that uh, or feeling all of that that takes in the impulses, and then there's um, buddhi, which is uh, wisdom, which is the um, which has the faculty of being able to um, make sense of uh, of what of what comes in, and. Um, was I meant to upload a picture too? I said there's three, but now I'm sort of uh, forgetting spacing on. Is it? Uh, but my, 
there's another, um, there's a hamkara too, if, which is the sense of I-ness, but I'm not sure if that is um, included in the aspect of the mind. But in any event, the, the, what we call the mind, the chitta is, it, it, it's, and the supposedly the chitta resides in the heart. So it also very much involves your emotions. So it's more, it's thinking, perceiving, understanding, all of the stuff that goes on, we would say in, in your head, and including processing information on the most basic level. All of this, so um, yoga is the stilling of all of the activity that goes on inside of you, basically. I mean, not the literally breathing, but everything else that you feel or think or uh, all of everything that's going on all the time. Yoga is the stilling of that. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is one of the three aspects of the mind having to do with, um, this is a weird question, with our soul and its ability to perceive the universe? Like yes. the universe perceiving itself? That would be the, I think that would be buddhi, yes. Buddhi. So yes, that would, that, that would very much be, that would be the mind as well. That would be chitta, because okay. buddhi is included in the mind, and buddhi is where resides the viveka, the um, the quality of buddhi is the ability to perceive, to um, the discriminating perception, resides in um, is in buddhi, and that is the ability that that's the closest we can get to. Uh, I mean, it's wis wisdom is one thing. The closest we can get to purusha, to the self. Oh, okay. And Purusha is the self and, right. and the universe, right? <laughs> yeah, Purusha is awareness. Awareness. Uh, Purusha has no form, so it's not really the universe. The universe is Prakriti also. Purusha is anything, anything that you can name, anything that you can describe, anything that has any kind of substance, um, even an idea, is Prakriti. Oh, wonderful. Purusha is indescribable, unnameable. I mean, I mean Purusha is the name for it, but could, Purusha could it be is formless. Called, could it be called chaos? Like primal chaos? No. Again, you no. can't really call it anything because Purusha is also not primal chaos. <laughs> be more like Prakriti in um, Prakriti's most uh, um, like pure, unformed uh, um, like prior to taking form, prior to taking the forms that we see, um, the uh, un, um, I'm forgetting the word right now, um, undifferentiated property. Um, okay. But Purusha is awareness. So think of it like right now you are aware. You're aware of my voice. If your eyes are open, you're aware of your computer or whatever you're looking at. You're aware of um, my face. You're aware of whatever else you can see around you. You can aware of whatever smells. You are aware of all these things. Now you can turn your head and you won't see my face. You'll still hear my voice, but you'll be aware of something else. Awareness remains constant. What you are aware of changes and awareness is not changed by what you are aware of. You still mm -hmm. remain aware. Does that, make, do you, does that make sense? So awareness itself is unchanging. Formless, colorless, um, odorless, <laughs> because awareness can be any odor, any color. You can be aware of anything, any color, any smell, and you are still aware. The quality of being aware doesn't change. What you are aware of changes. So the I, the self, Purusha, is pure awareness. And the awareness of being awareness, not of being anything else that you can be aware of. Mm. Any questions about that? <laughs> sort of the, you guys got that? Okay, that's enough. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now that we've covered that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, uh, so the point of stilling the movements of the mind, of, of, rest of restraining them, is that all of the stuff that is always going on inside from the simplest being perceiving the world, perceiving the pure sensations of the world, to all of the thoughts that are constantly coming up, get in the way of you, of, of us, each of us, perceiving our, um, perceiving that we are just awareness. Um, because we get so involved in the ongoing story that we miss the bigger picture that we, 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 we forget that it's a story and that we're just like, I like the, the image from bhakti yoga of that you are always sitting in your mother's lap mm. with your father's supporting arm behind her being told a story. And um, you get so wrapped up in the story that you forget that you're always safe and protected sitting in your mother's lap. Mm. Um, so you want to purify all of the exercises in yoga are meant also to purify the chitta so that you can um that it all it all calms down and becomes clear so it no longer is cloudy and blocking your view of who you really are who we each really are so what I have, yoga is about cleaning up the debris and changing our relationship to thinking. So in all teachings, like even Byron Katie talks a lot, which is about changing your relationship to thinking, to no, not so much thinking as what comes up in your mind as being the truth, but that it's just a thought. And a thought, and this is where yoga is very similar to like any other kind of teaching, a thought is just a thing. It's just a part of property like everything else. So a thought can be true or not true or mm -hmm. helpful or not helpful, but it's just another thing. And it's going to be replaced by another thought, another thing. It's not any more um, accurate than a pen is accurate. A pen is just a thing. Um, so the idea of questioning questioning your thoughts, questioning your un sort of spoken belief in what it is you think and how what you think then influences what you feel and questioning also then your feelings, whether your feelings are, you know, whether they're accurate as it were. <laughs> Again, not to, not to say that your feelings are wrong, but to say that, um, but, but this is all the whole point of getting to the place where you can um, recognize that, uh, that, you know, the, the miracle behind whatever it is that you are thinking or feeling is the fact of just being, or that's one perception of it that behind, even if you're thinking or feeling that you're furious or annoyed, um, that behind that, there is the miracle of being and of being aware. Aware of something that you don't particularly like at the moment, but nonetheless, being that, 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 the, bigger, that the bigger reality is, is that awareness. So one of the ways that yoga teaches to sorry melissa can i just interrupt emily emily mm -hmm. um i can hear you're you're distracting me with your tapping <laughs> and what melissa's saying is so profound i'm like wow i need can you mute your uh thank you sorry um it's hard to understand even without uh the oh <laughs> the yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to understand. i thought i was on mute i must have <laughs> Come off it accidentally. It's like what I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, you know, saying it or saying it is different from, like in, in yoga, there's the jnana is knowledge. Vijnana is like the experience, the experiential knowledge. It's easy enough to say, 
what these things are. To truly feel it, to actually know it, that is the point of yoga. But just like anything, well, and, and in yoga they have, in the philosophy they have a name for it, the samskaras, those are like the grooves, the patterned grooves like that you wear. So there's the samskaras that you are born with from past lifetimes, you know, that, that, that would be registered in you as actual parts of personality that tend to make you act or think or feel in a certain way. And there's the samskaras that you build in your life, you know, by your conditioned habit of like going to ice cream when you're unhappy or something like that. Then you get more and more ready to go to ice cream whenever you're unhappy. Whereas part of the practice is to create different autonomic pat patterns. So that is the meditation. So the, the, I, one of the ways that yoga teaches the um, restraint of the um, chitta vrittis is through meditation, which is described at the beginning of book three as basically picking a point, like the gold point there, putting all your attention to that point and keeping your attention going there. And this creates, the point of this is to create a new pattern, the Nirodha pattern, the pattern of control, the, the, the samskara, the, the, the habit of, of, of controlling your thoughts to kind of clear the energy field, to clear the chitta so that you can see to the truth. Any, any habit of created of creating a different relationship with thinking, with your chitta, with what goes on inside of you, rather than just um, automatically accepting it, would be consistent with yoga, because yoga is the, is the restraint of the activities of the chitta. So chitta also involves like just the actual perception, like seeing, taking in, that's what manas does. It takes in what, the, you know, the, um, what comes into your eyes and then, you know, process it, process it in a, in a, you know, kind of like not so much thinking, actively thinking, oh, this is what I'm seeing kind of way. So even the split second thought of um, however, like what I'm absorbing, what I'm seeing, what I'm smelling, these are not, um, however you want to think of it, you could think of it as energy, you could think of like, you know, the molecules of smell or of light bouncing off something and creating an image on the back of your retina, but that, that image is only the image that is created in the human eye, it's a different image created in, I mean that, all, all of those ways of thinking differently about all of the stuff that happens inside, including the most basic way that we process information that comes in, all of this starts to change your perception of yourself from being this thing and the world from being exactly as we understand ourselves to perceive it to be, to all of it being something that is an energy field that we are um, a mysterious element in that we don't actually know. And that really the only thing that we do know is that we are aware. And that is Purusha, awareness. They say the same thing in shamanism, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah. true. All of it yeah. says the same thing in, in every, every, pretty much every spiritual teaching says some aspect of that. All right, everybody got that? <laughs> okay, we'll chant this one more time and then go on to the next one. The first three are, you know, really important. So does anybody have any questions about the the chanting, the, the, the words, or the anything before we go on. Okay. So I'll lead it again, and then we'll do it together. Yoga shchitta vritti nirodaha Yoga shchitta vritti Okay, so we, we're going to talk about yoga, 
what is yoga, then why even bother? Why would you do it? What difference does it make? Why still those movements of the mind? We already talked about this. Tada, let's see, I want to put it up. Tada drastu svarupe vasanam. Say it together. Tada drastu svarupe vasanam. And then word by word. Tada, tada drastu. Drashtu Svarupe Svarupe Avastanam Avastanam So tada means then. Drashtu is the seer and it means uh, the seer is um, kam, dra, uh, comes uh, like drishti. Um, it's uh, the one who's obviously the witness, the seer, the experiencer. Sva means one's own. Rupe means form. And avastanam is uh, the, the seer then abides or occupies. Sta is the verb. And it or the root, and it means to stand. Um, this this root also shows up a lot, like in um, well, in the Sanskrit classes that I teach, I often point out that like like uh, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, all of these are have sta in it, and that's just where the Pakis, the Uzbekis, the um, the Kazakhs, where they stand, where they occupy. So avastanam is uh, the um, then the drashtu, the seer, occupies, it fully resides, fully occupies its own form. Then, then the seer is established in its own self. So you want to practice yoga so that you understand that you're the seer and you occupy that place completely and fully, which is the whole point, which we discussed in the last one. Um, any questions? Okay. Let's do it again one more time. Tada drashtu svarupe vastanam. Tada drashtu svarupe vastanam. I might stop singing just because it's uh... so. All right, to go back, uh, we're going to talk about yoga. What is yoga? Why practice it? And then, so then you can, because the seer can occupy, then the seer occupies it, then you can occupy your true nature as the seer, because at all other times, vritti sarupyam itaratra, together, vritti sarupyam itaratra. <coughs> Then, otherwise, at all other times, we identify with the vrittis, with the movements of the chitta, with the activity. Otherwise, we identify with the activity of the mind. Vritti sarupyam is, um, it assumes the same form. So, otherwise, we take the form of whatever's going on in our mind. Vrittaya panchat. Tayaha Krishta Krishta Together Vrittayaha Panchatayaha Krishta Krishta So the, the Vrittaya is the Vrittis, Pancha is five. So the, the Vrittis, the Vrittis, Panchataya, there are five. And klishta a klishta. So it, it's klishta is often this word, this is like the kleshas. Um, klish is uh, it pain, so it means whether it's klish or klesh, people argue. So, but basically, the five activities of thinking, of the mind, of the activities of the chitta, uh, 
we otherwise we identify with the activities of the mind so what are the activities of the five of, of the mind there are five activities of the mind and each of those five activities can be either painful or helpful or, or non-helpful or they can be not painful or helpful what they would be helpful towards is um knowing the self like so for example all of the other thoughts that we discussed back when we were talking about this these would consider to be helpful because they help you recognize who you are. But um, thinking, uh, I'm really going to let him have it, that would be a non-helpful thought in terms of under, not only would it be painful, but it would also be a non-helpful thought in terms of knowing your true nature. Um, any questions? OK. We'll do it again. Okay. And can you repeat that last part about um, it's not helpful because it's not knowing your true nature? Okay, so klishta is, um, can mean painful or it can mean obstructing. And then a klishta, anytime that you have the a added on, it would change the opposite meaning. So that would mean non-painful or non-helpful. Whether, you, whether the word is translated as painful, a klishta, or as um, obstructing, is, depends upon what you think its root is, but people say both. If something is obstructing, then it is promoting ignorance, because ignorance is what obstructs the view of seeing that you are purusha, that you are the self. So any thought that would be, that would fit in with one of the kleshas would be um, further supporting a view of yourself as the small self. So if you are thinking something like, I am really going to let that person have it, that is not a thought in which you are identifying with being awareness. Not that like, one of the most interesting things I find lately about gurus or spiritual teachers is that it's not like they're all warm and touchy-feely all the time. It's like they will, you know, they, they can be very disciplinarian and they can be very sort of strict and even a little bit severe. But, um, but people don't experience it. People, but, they, but it comes from a place of love and from non-attachment to some sort of personal sense of being wrong. And that would be the difference. The difference is the root. Is that clear? Yes, thanks. It's more clear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Melissa, would yeah. that also be like if you have that thought, but then right afterwards you're like, wow, I had that thought and that's not in line with my highest self and that's not really what I believe? Like, would that fit into this as well? Yeah, yeah. No, so having the thoughts, I mean, we're human beings. Having the thoughts is, is so first of all, this is just identifying. So the whole point is to um, restrain the activity of the chitta. If you want to restrain the activity of the chitta, the first thing is what are those activities so that you could recognize them when they happen so that you can build the skills of, of responding to them differently. So this is just information. It's telling you there are five different types. That, so, you, so, so, okay, what are these activities that we want to restrain? Well, there's five types and they can be painful or not painful. So you have, or obstructing or helpful. Um, so you have a thought that is, say, that is rooted in like a sense of ego, I-ness and dvesha, you know, aversion and, um, and that therefore also ignorance. You have that thought. And then you have another thought that is, I am not that. Then that thought is already starting to change your thought patterns. So you, you know, that, so yes, the answer is, then that other thought would be a helpful, a helpful thought. And there's nothing wrong with having had the first thought. You want to change your relationship to that thought, which is what you are then doing. And that's a type of control also, that nirodha, that's a type of then restraint of that particular thought to like clarify the mind. Okay, ready?
All right. I will chant it again. Here we go. Vrittaya panchataya klishta klishta Vrittaya panchataya klishta klishta Okay, so there are five types of movements of the activities of the mind, movements of the mind, and they can be painful or not painful. This sutra then lists those five. This is a typical structure in the um, yoga sutras where it tells you something, and like the, these definitional sutras, there are five types of movements of the mind, then it gives you those five, and then the next five sutras following this will be defining each of those five. So um, I have a birthday cake because um, it used to be thought that the mind was, it used to be thought that the mind was fully developed in some sense by the age of five. People no longer think that, but, um, but the, by the age of five, certain things start to happen. You, prior to the age of five, your sense of time is really like not there. The ability, by around five, we, most kids start to like, learn to go to school. So they, they start to, you know, you learn the alphabet, you start to learn to read, you start to learn to count, you start to learn, you start to learn all the ways of thinking and the ability to have sort of abstract conceptualizations about life. Um, the kind of abstract conceptualizations that we rely on heavily. Um, all of these things really do start, by round five is the time that you do actually start to um, develop the ability to think in the way that you will have to think as an adult functioning in the world. And again, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's why it's also a birthday cake. It's not, it's not a problem. It's a gift. The mind is a gift. So this is another thing about like, I like this about like Muktananda has a lot that he says about um, that, uh, I don't know, like Chitta Shakti, that there's, um, that it's a, um, that the chitta, it's, it's a re, we could not, without, the, without our thoughts, without the chitta, we would not be able to do the work um, to get us towards uh, awareness of our true nature. So there's nothing wrong with the, uh, these movements of the mind. It's being the one who's in control of them that we want. Okay, so this is mostly a list. I think I'm gonna, so it's pramana, viparyaya, vikalpa, nidra, smritayaha. So together, pramana, viparyaya, vikalpa, nidra, smritayaha. So the five activities of the mind is, is being understood as the first one is pramana, which is valid knowledge. Viparyaya is error or misperception. Vikalpa is usually translated in the Yoga Sutras as imagination, but it is, it's a word that occurs in a lot of Indian philosophy, and it's really often more something like conceptualization. Both of them work. Nidra is sleep, and um, smritaya is memory or recollection. So now we'll go through the definition of each of these. <clears throat> uh, just a second, I just want to ask. Somebody's in the kitchen. Can you be quiet? Who's in the kitchen? Um, so uh, the first one, pramana, is pratyaksha numana gamaha pramanani. So together. Pratyaksha numana, pratyaksha numana gamaha pramanani. So, um, just a second, Jesse, you have to wait another 15 minutes. So, the, these, these five ways of thinking are um, uh, technical terms that occur in um, a lot of Indian philosophy and uh, much Indian philosophy. So there's, there's Indian philosophy, the, the definition of these, and it, these are all 
these two, what makes up valid knowledge, are also all parts of, of Indian philosophy as well. Although um, there are different elements that sometimes are included or uh, not included. So pratyaksha is direct perception. So if you see something, you see it, that is considered valid knowledge. An anumana, anumana is inference or logical. You know, this is like if there's smoke, there's a fire. One could poke holes in any of these, of course. Agamaha is um, testimony or the reliable authority of others. Often this is translated as like uh, spiritual sources, like for the purposes of yoga, you know, the Vedas are a, a, a spiritual, and any, or the Bhagavad Gita, all of these are any sort of spiritual scripture. Uh, but it works in other things too, like a dictionary is also, is a valid, a, a source of an authority for the meaning of words, for example. And uh, pramanani, this is, that's the plural of pramana. Um, the sources of valid knowledge are direct perception, inference or logical processes, and uh, the uh, valid testimony, the testimony of, of a valid source. I have a question okay. about uh, direct perception. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that word a little more? About pratyaksha? Okay, so pratyaksha. let's see. I will give you the breakdown of the word. So it's from prati, which is towards, and, the, and then aksha, the eye. So, um, so anything towards the eye. Anything that the eye, it's, it's direct perception. It could obviously be the sense of smell or hearing, but uh, we tend to give preference to the eyes as the source of perception. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I'll read it again. Pratyaksha numana gamaha pramanani. And again, you notice pramana, na, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cerebral na, if you can say pranani. Okay, together. Pratyaksha numana gamaha pramanani. So that's valid knowledge. So what is misperception or error? Viparyayo mitya jnanam atadrupa pratishtam. Together, viparyayo mitya jnanam atadrupa pratishtam. Misperception or error is wrong is uh, is wrong knowledge, mitya jnanam, not based on its true form. Uh, so viparyayo is a uh, misperception, like viparyaya. Um, Amitya jnanam is a uh, false knowledge. Um, a means not, tadrupa, not on its form. Not, and pratishtam is like um, avastanam. Again, it's based on sta, not established, not based on its, as, or established. So it's, it's something not based on its true form. So the traditional image, the traditional, uh, the traditional um, metaphor given for this is um, mistaking a rope for a snake or a snake for a rope. Either way, you see something, but you get it wrong. Any questions? Okay. Again, viparyayo mitya jnanam atadrupa pratishtam. Together, viparyayo mitya jnanam atadrupa pratishtam. All right, vikalpa. The kalpa is defined as imagination or, or conceptualization is thought is based on is a thought based on words without actual substance. So 
So I think this is a very interesting definition. So whether it's, so, so for example, you can say a red winged horse and you see the words create a form, an idea in your mind, but there is still no such thing as a red winged horse. It doesn't exist, but you see it, you have the sense of it. So, so that's imagination, that makes sense for imagination. Now, another important meaning of um, Vikalpa is conceptualization, but let's say it first and then I'll talk about that. Shabda jnana nupati vastu shunyo vikalpaha. Shabda jnana nupati vastu shunyo vikalpaha. Shabda means sound or word. Jnana again is knowledge. Anu, again, Anu is, again, following, Pati is, uh, Pati is falling, is falling, Anu is following, but Anupati means arising, follows, or is dependent on. So, um, Vastu is a real object, something that actually exists, a thing. Shunyo is empty, and Vikalpa, again, is decision. So, Vikalpa is, uh, it's, it's knowledge based on a sound, shabda, that is, uh, that is based on, arises, anupati, follows, is based on the sound, without, shun is vastu, it's empty of vastu, of reality, of a thing, it doesn't have an actual thing behind it. Um, so, Vikalpa is imagination, but it's also conceptualization, which is something that we use a lot. It also involves metaphors. Um, so, for example, friendship. There, there's no such thing as friendship. There are friends, but friendship itself is an idea. There is no thing you can point to that is friendship. That's Vikalpa. A to-do list. You know, you can have the actual list, but things to do, the actual written to-do list, the list itself is a thing. But the notion of things to do is vikalpa. There are, you know, there, it's not, that, that's, a, that's a way that you've organized experience in order to make sense of it. Um, a heart of gold, there's no such thing as a heart of gold, but we know what you mean if you say somebody has a heart of gold versus a heart of stone. These are all vikalpas. So, uh, so again, any of these things, the, the right knowledge can be, can be helpful or not helpful. Um, wrong knowledge can be helpful or not helpful or painful or not painful. Uh, vikalpas can be helpful, helpful or not helpful or painful or not painful. And then we get to sleep. Uh, oh, does anybody have any other questions about vikalpa? Okay, I guess we'll say it one more time. Shabda, shabda, jnana, nupati, vastu, shunyo, vikal, paha. Together. Shabda, jnana, nupati, vastu, shunyo, vikal, paha. I didn't give that pati quite enough, but. Okay, sleep. Abhava. Pratyaya lambana vrittir nidraha. Nidra, not nidra. Okay, together. Abhava pratyaya lambana vrittir nidra. Um, abhava is the absence. Pratyaya is an idea that shows up a lot too. A lambana is um, um, lambana. It's like a shalam um, shalamba sarvangasana is uh, all limbs supported pose. That's shoulder stand. A lambana is a support. So a lambana is depending on or having as a base. Vritti again is movements. So uh, sleep is nidra is the movement the idea the understand the movement of the mind that has as its understanding and is dependent upon 
is dependent upon the idea of negation. So they're talking about deep sleep, not sleep when you're dreaming. So the question that naturally arises, so if what you want to, if at all other times you are identifying with the movement of the mind, what happens when you're asleep? So this is telling you that when you're asleep, that's just another movement of the mind that thinks that you're not being, that thinks that you're not there, but you really are still there and you're really still aware and you're not controlling your thoughts. It's just the movement of the mind that has as its base the sense of that you're not that you're not a lot you're not being anymore but you are still being does that make sense okay abhava pratyaya lamba lambana vrittir nidra abhava pratyaya lambana vrittir nidra so then finally, memory. Anubhuta vishaya sampramoshaha smriti. Anubhuta vishaya sampramoshaha smriti. Memory, smriti, is uh, the non theft, asampramoshaha not letting go of vishaya, an object, anubhuta, that has been experienced, following anubhu, being. So it's the holding on to things so tight that you can't, that it can't even be stolen from you, an idea, a thing, something experienced. So these are my son's first baby shoes. Um, memory is not just about holding on to uh, your childhood toys or, you know, your son's baby shoes or, you know, all the pictures that you've saved. It's, and it's not, it, memory is actually very important. Without memory, we also couldn't um, do practice. Memory require, like you couldn't make coffee. <laughs> you couldn't take a walk. You wouldn't know your friends from your, you know, you wouldn't know your mother from anybody else on the street. Memory as anybody who has ever dealt with an aging uh, relative with Alzheimer's, memory, without memory, there's a lot of functioning that can't happen. Um, any questions? Okay, so now we've gone through, it's defined the five types of movements of the mind and we have got the first part. So then it goes back, it refers to so the, so, to go through. So what is, we're going to talk about yoga. Yoga is the stilling of the chitta vrittis, which you want to do so that you can then know yourself as the self. Um, at all other times, you identify with the movements of the mind. There are five of these movements of the mind, and they can be painful and not painful. We go to the five types, and we describe what they are, and then we go back to how do you deal with these movements of the mind. And then this is, whoops. So here we go. So now we return, now the Yoga Sutras are referring back again to the Sutra number two, Yogashtata Vritini Rodaha, and it's telling you how you're going to work with those movements of the mind. Abhyasa Vairagya Vyam Tan Nirodaha. Together. Abhyasa Vairagya Vyam Tan Nirodaha. Abhyasa is practice. Vairagya is um, dispassion or non-attachment. Tan nirodha, tad uh, nirodha, again. So these, of these, the five movements of the mind, we will nirodha, will control them with abhyasa and vairagya. Again, again. Abhyasa, vairagya, vyam, tan nirodha together. Abhyasa vairagya vyam tan nirodaha. And the next few sutras will further, further, just a sec, will further, will then give more, um, will go into, uh, will define abhyasa and vairagya.
Does somebody want to ask a question? Yeah, I did. Could we sing 1.12? Yes. Uh, let me see if I can get it. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I just, for me to go back and forth between speaking and singing is sometimes more difficult for me. If I was just going through singing, easier. Okay. Abhyasa vairagya bhyam tan nirodaha. Together. Abhyasa vairagya bhyam tan nirodaha. We can do it again. Abhyasa vairagya bhyam tan nirodaha. We'll do it one more time and then we'll just sit for a minute. Abhyasa vairagya bhyam tan nirodaha. The play of effort, working at it, and letting go, including letting go of the results of the effort. Letting go of the attachment to anything is the two tools that you use to still the movements of the mind, to, to control the activity of thinking. So we'll start, maybe next time we'll chant the first three, and this one we'll start with this one, and then get on to more about Abhyasa and Vairagya. Any questions before we end? Um, Melissa, it would be really helpful if we could have just audio recordings of you saying each of the sutras that we've gone through. Um, I find that like with this one going through them a bunch of times is really helpful. And so for me to be able to put something on repeat and just like repeat it over and over again would be really powerful and helpful. For me, if that's uh, how could that be done? So one thing that we could do is, I mean, I could, an audio recording, um, I could do an audio recording like separate from this and uh, email that to you. Um, oh, that would be great. Yeah. If, you, if you'd be willing to do that. Yeah. Also, I was thinking perhaps at the beginning of the next class, we can um, chant up to where we are and possibly even maybe we'll chant through the next few sutras. We'll chant mm. up to, we'll start off and chant up to say 116 and then we'll, then we'll go back and go over the meaning starting at 12 so that then also if you go back to listen you'll get it just chanted that would also be really helpful okay we'll start like that next time and so we'll chant the first 16 together we'll just go through them and then i'll start talking about them 
then I'll go back and talk about 12 to 16. And then if we have enough time, we'll move on. Thank you. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right. And if I have time this week, I will try to uh, do an audio file and um, find it and make it available of chanting the chanting the sutras chanting i mean ideally i would do an audio file of all of book one you know so that you would have it all but that, that uh so i'll see if i have enough time for that <laughs> time is also a limited resource <laughs> i totally understand thank you Alta. i could try doing an audio file of at least up to what we're going to start with next time so that you guys are ready for it hmm. potentially <laughs> okay no commitments no expectations no. i appreciate it thank you no. all right Danyavada. thank you all very much and thank i'll you see, so you, see you next week thank you, thank you. And, uh,